Wow. Um, okay, so I was going to first go over this first assignment. Here we go. This is the first assignment. This is the PDF version. Um, so uh, it's due February 3rd, which is a week from tomorrow um, via Canvas by 11.55 PM, as I said before, I, you know, whatever. I just put that in because people kept asking me what time it was due. So I'm like, okay, 11.55 PM. <laughs> uh, you know, but if you get it in at 11.57, I'm not gonna care. All right. Uh, so you're supposed to answer one of these questions. So basically like answer a question means it's kind of like more like a take home exam than it is like a paper. Um, Right, I'm not real. I'm not asking you to establish your own thesis or anything. Just you know, there's a there's a list of questions. Pick one of the questions and answer it. Um, so as it says here, you know, what I'm mostly going to be looking for in the answer is um, like accuracy. Um, now, accuracy. I mean, there there definitely are. You know, it's not always clear exactly what Hobbes means. So uh, there could be different answers that would be right. You know, I mean, like your safest close, sticking close to the interpretation that I gave in class if you followed that. But, uh, but if you have a different interpretation you can argue for it. Um, um, you know, it's, Ideal if you can answer the question with reference to the text, which by which I mean not like quoting huge chunks of it or whatever, but saying where Hobbes says certain things or, you know, um, uh, if you can only do it from your lecture notes, that's not as good, but it's, you know, okay. I mean, if like, and if you do have some kind of like, special, you know, like original insight into how the answer works. That, of course, is wonderful, but it's not, that's really kind of like extra on an assignment like this. Um, plagiarism, I think I already talked about that at the beginning of the class. I already said there's been a lot of it lately. Please don't do it. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I don't really care what reference style you use or anything like that. There isn't really a standard for this field as there is in some fields. So there's no point in teaching you some style. Um, just as long as it's clear what you're citing, that's fine. Um, and here are the questions. There's a choice of five questions. Um, some people have already asked me questions about particular ones. Are there any questions people want to ask now about that? I don't see the chat right now, but I'll give it back. Okay. Um, what is it? Could you go over what you said about quoting in the book? Because I know the, the page the paper is pretty short, so. What are your rules on that? Well, you know, there's no rules. I mean, first of all, I see that some people are saying they still can't hear me. I feel like the problem must be on your end because everyone else can hear me, but I don't know what's going on. Two people can't. All right. Uh, I can't do anything about that, as far as I know. Um, yeah, about quoting, well, you know, um, um, you know, there isn't a, like, you're not gonna wanna have long, undigested quotes. There isn't a, like, room for that. Um, but, um, I mean, 
you know, if you can support what you're saying by putting in some of Hobbes's actual words and then saying in parentheses where they come from, um, that would be nice, right? So, you know, like um, Hobbes says that uh, the liberty of the subject is the absence of quote, artificial chains, you know, chapter, whatever, section, whatever, by which he means blah, 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 right? I mean, that's, I, I don't know if that's relevant to any of the questions off the top of my head, but that's just an example. Is that helpful? There isn't really a rule about this, except, I mean, but it's, I don't really have yeah. a rule about this, except just like, um, No, know. that's helpful. I think the only part that I was kind of confused on was, I think in, I don't know if this was for the final essay, but I think you did mention like, you were like, don't answer each question. And that's where I kind of got confused. It was like. That's for the final essay, right? Okay. Those yeah. are not really questions. Those are like suggested paper topics and they have a lot of different possibilities under them. But for this, it's just a question. And you should try to answer every part if you can. Um, so, I mean, uh, sometimes it turns out there's a part that's too hard. I made some notes from last time I gave this assignment and I made some changes, but still, sometimes it turns out there's a part that's too hard and no one can answer it. And then, you know, uh, I give up on that part. <laughs> but you should try to answer every part as best you can. Okay, are there other questions? Could I ask you one about a specific prompt? Yes. Uh, so it's for prompt number five. Yeah. Um, at the very end, it says, uh, take account of what Hobbes means by rights and of the sense in which civil laws can limit the rights of subjects. Is the, um, way that civil laws limit the rights of subjects, is that different than the citizens laying down their rights and to form the Commonwealth? Um, well, it's basically the same thing, right? That is the, the, the sovereign gets the power to legislate from the, that initial laying down of rights. So the civil laws are, you know, are, like the civil laws are, can go beyond the laws of nature. They will go beyond the laws of nature. So they are like, you know, directly contained in the initial laying down of rights. But yeah, that's the basis for it. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, and some people put the assignment in the, Oh yeah, because someone was asking where to find the assignment. Yes, and those are two places you could find it. The one I'm showing is the PDF version just because the HTML version might be more convenient, but I, my browser was starting really slowly. So, all right. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about Hobbes and religion. Um, Oh, question about why I don't just use Canvas. Um, first of all, I had this all set up before we had Canvas. <laughs> um, I'm kind of frozen right now, aren't I? Hmm. All right, let me quit Acrobat, maybe that will help. No. Uh, it'll be a miracle if I ever get to lecture. All right. That's again. Um, yeah, the fan is going and you may be hearing that. That's correct. Uh, 
Let me just make sure. Yeah, I think that noise is just there. Okay, now I'm not frozen anymore, yes. So um, why don't I, you know what, I've actually, um, those various answers already went up. Apocalypse is way better branding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I started this whole, I started this up before I had Canvas. Um, we switched from one system to another and then to another. And uh, meanwhile, my thing just keeps working. So <laughs> I think it's better. Plus it's more flexible than Canvas. Like I can, you know, do my own format. So, but if you go to Canvas, if you go to the Canvas site, there should be a uh, link to the online syllabus. So if you ever forget where it is, you should be able to find it that way too. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about Hobbes and religion. So, um, or at least Hobbes on religion. So, um, so Hobbes makes several distinctions between different types of religion, but it isn't clear uh, what each of them comes to or how they go together. So I'm gonna write three things up here on the board. So first of all, there's a distinction between religion and superstition. But second of all, there's a distinction between true religion and false religion. And thirdly, there's a distinction between, he doesn't make as much of a big deal about this one, at least not in the parts I assigned, but, um, but it's important. The natural religion and and revealed religion. Um, so let me talk about one, the first one first, because um, I think right away you can see how confusing this is from, the, from three things he says about it in different places. So um, the first one, oops, is in chapter 11, paragraph 26 on page 63. And Right. Paragraph 26. Oh, oh, it's up here at the top. Oh, okay. Of course. Um, and this fear of things invisible is the natural seed of that which everyone in himself calleth religion. And in them that worship or fear that power otherwise than they do, superstition. Right, so the first uh, way of defining the difference between religion and superstition is that religion is the way is the way I worship the invisible power that I fear, and superstition is the way other people who don't agree with me worship the uh, the invisible power that they fear. Um, so that's one definition of the difference between religion and superstition. Now here's another one. This is in chapter six, paragraph 36 on page 31. This one looks kind of like an official definition. Okay. 
Fear of power invisible feigned by the mind or imagined from tales publicly owned, sorry, publicly allowed religion, not allowed superstition. This is part of a list of definitions that I it doesn't say, you know, is or whatever. So, right, so religion is defined as um, fear of invisible powers insofar as it's allowed, whereas superstition is defined as the same thing when it's not allowed. And then he adds, when the power imagined is truly such as we imagine, true religion. Right, so true religion is when you um, fear a power that's publicly allowed or based on tales that are publicly allowed and you're right. <laughs> um, that is the tales are true. Um, notice that according to that definition, if you believe something that's true, but not allowed, that counts as superstition. <laughs> Okay, um, and then here's one more place. This is chapter 12, page 65. So this one is not as clearly about the meaning of the words religion and superstition, but uh, it does seem to imply a way of understanding them. Paragraph eight on page 65. Um, Okay, so the context is um, that people who don't know about cause and effect have no way of assigning causes to effect except experience, right? I mean, this again is what shows that although Hobbes believes that uh, every thought in our mind has its origin and sense, he's not an empiricist. Right, because he's saying the way ignorant people try to determine cause and effect relations is empirically. <laughs> All right, so anyway, um, and therefore, so what happens to these people? Therefore, from the like things past, they expect the like things to come and hope for good or evil luck superstitiously from things that have no part at all in the causing of it. So that's a, you know, that's a definition of superstition that's not directly opposed to religion, as I said, but it does seem to be relevant there. Um, uh, superstition would mean that um, you reach the conclusion that there's a, a certain kind of invisible power you should fear based on experience rather than reason. So, right, so um, in all these cases, there's something wrong about superstition, but it's not the same thing. So the first two understandings, the difference between religion and superstition is relative, right? That is, um, um, I, you know, what's religion to me is superstition to you and vice versa. And so what's wrong with superstition is it disagrees with me, <laughs> I, the way I use the word. On the second way, in terms of what's allowed and what isn't, what's religion in one place is superstition in another place because what's allowed is gonna depend on the will of the sovereign. Um, I suppose in a state of nature, these two things would fall together. Right in a state of nature, I'm allowed to believe whatever I want. But uh, in a civil state, I'm only allowed to believe, uh, you know, things that the sovereign allows. Or well, the only tales I'm allowed to base my belief on are the ones the sovereign allows to be told. So, um, so if sovereigns in different places allow different tales to be told, then what's religion in one place will be superstition in the other and vice versa. Um, and um, of course, uh, 
I'm going to think, that is, imagine that my religion in the first sense, can you write these three senses down? Are people clear on what these three senses are? Oh, what was the superposition on page 63? I don't know. There was a superposition. It's probably, it was like quantum mechanics. All right. Um, are people clear on what these three definitions of superstition are? Maybe I should write them down. Like one is, you know, disagrees with me. Another is, called B and C, um, not allowed. And I see someone asked, not allowed by who? But I think I've answered that now, right? Not allowed by the person who has the power to allow and not allow things. That is the sovereign. And the last one is not rational. Based on experience rather than reason based on prudence rather than science. Um, um, right, so what I was saying is that these two definitions of superstition are relative. The first one is relative to the person and the other one is relative to the law under which the person falls. Um, moreover, according to those two definitions, um, the difference between superstition and religion has nothing to do with these two things, right? That is um, both religion as far as this goes, both religion and superstition are natural. They both come about by, because of certain tendencies in human nature. Um, and in fact, most of chapter 12 is about the origin of superstition in that, um, sorry, wait, what am I saying? Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, what I wanted to say about these two is they're not, that, that on these, the difference between religion and superstition is not related to these because religion or superstition on that definition can be either true or false, right? So, um, because it's, you know, just a matter of whether what I believe or what the sovereign allows happens to be the true religion or not true religion. And similarly, it could be either revealed or natural, right? That is, it could be that I believe what I believe because miraculously it was revealed to me, or it could be that I naturally came to believe it. Either way, I'm going to call mine religion and everyone else's superstition. And similarly, with respect to the second one. On the other hand, on this third understanding, um, um, on this third understanding, on the one hand, both superstition and religion are natural, right? That is, we're, and this is what I was starting to say before, but I got confused. So, right, because we're given in most of chapter 12 is about the explanation of superstition in this sense, right? How by people's experience and, um, and, uh, uh, irrational fears and so forth, they come to uh, invent invisible causes for everything that's happening to them, or at least to the ones, things they care about that happen. Um, so that's the natural explanation of superstition, which throughout chapter 12, he mostly just calls religion. Right? But on the other hand, of course, the causes of uh, religion that is rational uh, conclusions about the causes of events, the, let's say ultimate causes of all events. Um, that's also natural. It's due to the human natural faculty of reason. It doesn't require revelation. Um, 
So as far as this one goes, um, it's not connected to this distinction because in both cases, we're talking about something natural. Now, on the other hand, it is connected to this distinction because um, if you reason correctly, your conclusion has to be true. So if there really is rational religion, then whatever uh, part of re religion is rational, that has to be true religion. Um, and moreover, uh, in this sense of superstition versus religion, that is where we're talking about rational religion, it differs from um, other religion, not just in that it happens to be true, right? So not like that definition from chapter six, where he says religion is blah, blah, blah. And if it's true, then it's true religion, right? Where it's, it's you know, um, um, like if a whole bunch of people guess and one of them is right, then although no one can tell, that one is true religion according to that definition. But if you're talk, if you think some religion is rational, then that's not just coincidentally true, but it's true because it's come about by a cause that tends to produce truth rather than error, namely reason. Um, Okay, so um, I don't want to segue to what I was going to say next. I'm not, I'm not helping. Um, I guess, I guess I would say, so for that reason, this version of distinction, even though it's the one that Hobbes emphasizes the least, seems like the most important one for understanding like um, what kind of religion he would think is, ha actually has a special status. So someone's asking, can I explain the third one again, please, right? So the third one is, is this, you know, both, uh, according to, to, to the third one, both re religion and superstition come about by trying to figure out what are the causes of events, especially events that matter to us, and thinking about that. But the difference is the way we do that. So most people, except the rare people like Hobbes who, who, who have science, um, most people do that using their experience. Um, so, uh, you know, um, and this has various results for the type of explanation they come up with. So when they can't see a visible cause for something, um, of course they don't go uh, to an invisible cause that's completely different from the causes they've experienced. They assume the cause is similar to ones they've experienced before. And so they end up thinking that the causes of these events that happen to them are like human beings, only they're invisible and have special powers. That's Hobbes' explanation anyway. I'm not sure like how convincing that is, but, uh, um, but that's what he says. And also when they ask themselves, okay, so how do I, you know, how do those invisible powers operate? How can I predict them? How can I, uh, you know, influence them, et cetera? They base that on things they've seen happen. So they saw something bad happen after a bird flew by on their left. And that happened once or twice. And they, they conclude that, oh, a bird flying by my left is an omen sent by the gods, right? Um, 
or you know similarly if they do something and then they have bad luck afterwards they conclude oh the gods didn't want me to do that so that's how superstition is arrived at as opposed to um, religion in this sense of religion would be the religion you arrive at by using reason to determine and that is by reasoning from the definitions of words according to Hobbes to figure out what are the causes of events. Did that help understand what that third distinction is? Maybe I should, that was all long and complicated. I see, should just put it simply, right? It just means that in this sense, superstition is like irrational conclusions about the invisible causes of events. Whereas uh, religion, properly speaking, would be rational conclusions about, again, the invisible causes of events. Like the, the one ultimate invisible cause of events. Uh, someone asked, so true religion is arrived at by a reason, is revealed religion. Well, I mean, um, uh, what I just pointed out is that both sides of this distinction seem to belong to natural religion. Because a natural explanation for both of these so revealed religion is left over as a question. What is that? And hopefully I'll have something to say about that later. All right. So, um, yeah, so I think you can see in more detail um, how this works. If you look into the, his detailed explanations of how um, where superstition comes from. And again, what he calls religion in chapter 12 is mostly what would be called superstition in this sense. It's the irrational kind. So there are three roots of religion in this sense, he says. And um, these are all, again, on, on page 63. Hopefully there'll be no superposition this time. I don't know what that was. Okay, does it? Does that look okay now? All right. So these are all three of these are supposed to be, he emphasizes the peculiar to human beings. That is, I guess, they have something to do with a creature that could reach rational conclusions, only something goes wrong and it doesn't for the most part. So, and first it is peculiar to the nature of man to be inquisitive into the causes of events they see, some more, some less, but all men so much as to be curious in search of the causes of their own good and evil fortune. So at least everyone is curious about the causes of good and bad things that happen to them. Secondly, upon sight of anything that hath a beginning to think also it had a cause, which determined the same to begin then when it did rather than sooner or later. So not only are human beings naturally inquisitive about the causes of events, but it, given that an event by definition is something that happens at a certain time and didn't happen before that, um, they also naturally are, uh, believe that every event has some cause, if only they could find out what it was. And thirdly, um, actually, let me skip most of that. Uh, The third one, and this is the part where relying on experience comes in. Man observeth how one event hath been produced by another and remembereth in them antecedents and consequence. And when he cannot assure himself of the true causes of things, for the causes of good and evil fortune for the most part are invisible, he supposes causes of them, 
either such as his own fancy suggesteth or trusteth to the authority of other men, such as he thinks to be his friends and wiser than himself. So what happens here is that um, because if people don't know how to find true causes, they, they'll just follow their own experience. And that means um, it, they in effect end up following like whatever strikes them as relevant to something happening. Um, and that means basically following their own fancy or what someone else tells them. Um, I mean, maybe I should explain that a little bit more clearly. It's, I mean, I think it works like this. So um, they assume that there must be some cause uh, like among the things that they've experienced as antecedents to this event, but they can't figure out what the true cause is. But because of those first two points, which all human beings share, they're not willing to rest and say, I don't know what the cause is. So therefore, that's why the last part, he cannot assure himself of the true causes of things, he supposes causes of them. I still feel like I didn't explain that quite uh, connected away as I should have. Other questions about that? So someone says false religion is, Vanessa asks, false religion is irrational and not publicly allowed as opposed to true religion. Well, no, I mean, again, these are three different distinctions he gives between religion and superstition. The first one was that religion is what I call my beliefs in invisible causes and superstition is what I call everyone else's if they don't agree with me. The second one is that it's distinguished by whether it's allowed. So in either of those senses, it could be, and actually for the most part is the case that the, what's gonna count as religion is the irrational stuff. Right, like if my beliefs happen to belong to the irrational kind, the kind that's being called superstition in the third sense, then in the first sense, I'm gonna call those religion because they're my beliefs. And if someone else has rational beliefs, I'm gonna call that superstition because they disagree with me. And similarly, in this case, you know, if what's publicly allowed to be taught is irrational stories, like let's say we're in Athens, at least as Hobbes imagines it, and they're teaching all these like fanciful stories about the gods and how Zeus will strike you down with thunder if you do so-and-so and whatever. Um, so, uh, that, that belongs to the irrational part of type of religion, but it's not publicly allowed to question it. And that's why the sovereign assembly has the right to put Socrates to death for questioning it or for calling it into doubt. Um, okay, is that clear? I know I know it's confusing to talk about things like this, but they're so important in philosophy that, you know, it's, it's three different ways of understanding the same pair of terms. They don't line up with each other. But Hobbes introduces all three of them. So like, it's uh, like, uh, the confusion isn't my fault. In a sense, it's Hobbes's fault, but it's probably deliberate. Right? Like he probably doesn't want to make it that clear or what he thinks of as superstition um, or that he thinks everything that's not rational religion is superstition. So again, like there's a question of how to properly define your terms for certain purposes. Um, for some purpose, you might want to define it this way. Like if you're trying to teach people what they should actually believe and how they should actually deduce what they should do and so forth, then you want to define it this way. But if you want to, for example, not undermine the sovereign by calling the publicly allowed religion into question, then you want to be careful of defining it that way. 
Um, I mean, that's only, it's, it's more complicated than that too. Like you don't wanna make it too obvious that you're saying, there's no reason to think the religion taught in this country is the true religion. Someone asked, how would Hobbes characterize the Catholic Church? Well, Hobbes says plenty about how he characterizes the Catholic Church, right? I mean, he says it's superstition, but it's a little ambiguous whether he means this sense of superstition, because now England is Protestant and Catholicism is not allowed, or this sense of superstition, or some combination of the two, right? He also says that the, you know, um, um describes the pope as a like nefarious political actor who has tried to extend dominion over everyone else's kingdom um, um of course if he could succeed in that then presumably there would be nothing wrong with it from hobbes's point of view it's, the problem is that he didn't succeed in that um, so they, he didn't bring peace to that dominion, um, or the, the popes, generally speaking, didn't succeed in bringing peace to that dominion. There were constant wars, like between emperors and popes in the Middle Ages. The, the Holy Roman Emperor would go to war with the pope. <laughs> um, so the pope's power was a cause of tumult and sedition rather than of um, uh, like civil peace. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to say about that, but I'm not gonna say more about it because I wanna go on and talk about this. Um, so, um, but in any case, so I was just saying, so the causes of superstition, according to Hobbes, are number one, our desire to know about causes, number two, our belief that everything has a cause, and then number three, are, let's say, bad resources for finding causes of things, actually. So whereas religion, like rational religion, is going to be based on those first two things, plus the correct method of figuring out what the causes are. So, um, um, so as he says towards the end of chapter 12, where he's been talking about again, in this sense, superstition the whole time, towards the very end of chapter 12, page uh, where is this? Oh, wait, maybe this isn't the end of chapter 12. No, it's not the end of chapter 12, sorry. It's <laughs> Near the beginning, check it out. It's on page 64. Um, is that visible? No, there. All right. Why is this sometimes better than other times? That must be where I put this note. Oh, what? Okay. Anyway. Um, but the acknowledging of one God eternal, infinite, and omnipotent may more easily be derived from the desire men have to know the causes of natural bodies and their several virtues and operations than from the fear of what may, was to befall them in time to come. For he that from any effect he seeth come to pass should reason to the next and immediate cause thereof, and from thence to the cause of that cause and plunge himself profoundly into the pursuit of causes, shall at last come to this, that there must be, as even the heathen philosophers confessed, one first mover, that is a first and eternal cause of all things, which is that which men mean by the name of God. 
right? So he's saying that the belief in the true God, which is um, the God that's one, uh, omnipotent, etc., also comes about by thinking about causes, but it comes about by, um, first of all, realizing that um, um, you only know the cause if you can reason from the cause to the effect. Number two, that therefore you often don't know the cause, but that there is a cause. And so based on that, you can reason, right? So like reason not based on anything you know about the individual causes of this event, but just from the fact that it must have a cause, you say, oh, and that must have a cause, and that must have a cause, and that must have a cause. And this is basically a version of what Kant calls the cosmological proof. Um, saying that, you know, since there are events in the universe that um, uh, can't be explained unless we think that some prior event caused them and there can't be an infinite regress. It's important to fill that part in somehow, why there can't be an infinite regress. Um, therefore, there must be a first cause and that cause um, can't have started acting at a certain time or else you would need a, an explanation for that. And so it must be eternal. Um, there's all kinds of issues about that proof, about what it proves, about how it could be consistent with the beginning of the world in time. Um, uh, because why did God create the world at one time rather than another? Um, uh, but uh, I think it's actually not that important for these purposes to understand how or whether Hobbes thinks the proof really works. Um, the main point is uh, The conclusion of this proof is that the ultimate cause of everything is something infinitely powerful and incomprehensible. Right? Remember, we saw him saying that way back when about God that we can't, um, because we can only think finite things and this cause based, that you get to based on this reason must be infinite. It, we can't understand at all what it is. Okay, so what's the point of that? So that's the content of the rational religion that's not superstition. As I pointed out before, even if we assume that Hobbes thinks the proof works perfectly, um, the conclusion is still hard to distinguish from atheism. It says that the ultimate cause of something, of everything is what is named by a word whose meaning we can't understand. <laughs> uh, oh, I see Alvaro has his hand up. Oh no, Samantha has her hand up, sorry. Did you wanna ask something? Or is that, I'm sorry, I don't always notice those hands. No, maybe not. Okay, I'll go on. Um, so, um, hey, uh, Professor, I, I did have a question. Oh, yeah. Okay. What's your question? It was regarding the first three points that you made about your, the distinctions between religion versus superstition and all of the ones that follow. Yeah. Are you saying that these distinctions change for each of the types of um, religion versus superstition, the ABC that you wrote on the right side? Or were you just applying them? in different ways for these like for the relational ones a and b yeah. are you saying that true religion is what is allowed or what um that person thinks or no. are you what i was saying these are all types of the first one a b and c right they're all types of distinction between superstition and religion okay and then what I said was, I then you know went into how this distinction is related to the other two, depending on which of these you choose. 
right? So like, if you choose one of these, then the criterion for being religion versus superstition has nothing to do with whether it's true or not. So there's no reason to think that religion would be true and superstition would be false. It could be the other way around. Okay. Um, and uh, similarly for this, you know, it has no, those, those first two things have no connection to whether something was arrived at naturally or miraculously revealed. Okay. Um, whereas on the third one, I was claiming that religion is true and superstition is, well, if it's false, it's false by act. I mean, if it re religion is necessarily true, superstition could only be true by accident. Right, because it's irrational. So it's, you know, and I was claiming that on the third one, uh, both religion and superstition are natural and we don't like have a place for revealed re religion yet in the classification. Okay, so, um, so what, I want to, what I wanted to go on to then is, so if that's the content of, that is the theoretical content of, of rational religion, the doctrine, just that um, the ultimate cause of everything is something incomprehensible. Um, what is the practical significance of that? So that really amounts to two questions. The first question is, why, which you know, I've already talked about some, but I'm gonna talk about again, why are the laws of nature divine laws? Right, if we can understand that, then we understand what, how somehow reason is connecting the laws that it suggests for our actions to its theoretical conclusion about God. Um, and the other part of the question is, and this matches up with the two things that uh, Hobbes lists in chapter, chapter 31. Um, why does reason imply that we should honor God or worship God? Um, um, so, right, so does why, in addition to following the laws of nature, does reason suggest we should do something else relative to this incomprehensible thing? Um, so as far as the law of nature goes, um, remember what Hobbes said about them at the end of chapter 15, on page 100. Um, I need a better table. An extra table or something. Um, yeah. I don't understand why the light is on. Maybe if I turn this light down. Oh, that's better. All right. Um, these dictates of dictates of reason men use to call, that is right, they're they're in the habit, they usually call by the name of laws, but improperly. For they are but conclusions or theorems concerning what conduces to the conservation and defense of themselves. So again, it turns out that Hobbes has been using the word law improperly throughout the last two chapters and he only tells us at the end. They're not properly called laws. Whereas law properly is the word of him that by right hath command over others. That's the same definition of law that he gives in other places. But then he adds, but yet if we consider the same theorems as delivered in the word of God, 
that by right commandeth all things, then are they properly called laws. So this quote is chapter 15, uh, paragraph 41, and it's on page 100 in this edition. Do the laws of, so someone says, do the laws of nature and divine laws both point to a sort of transcendental justice or cause and effect? Like, is that how they're similar? Well, the laws of nature and the divine laws are the same. <laughs> Um, or at least, I guess, the uh, laws of nature and the divine laws for um, relations between human beings are the same. Then there's this additional thing about worship, which I'm going to talk about next. But so, um, right, the difference, Hobbes says, is only whether you refer them to God as God's commandments or just consider them as counsels of reason. If you just consider them as counsels of reason, they're not properly called laws. But if you think of them as God's commands, well, in that case, they're properly called laws, but the exact same laws. Now, um, what does it mean, however, that we think of them as God's commands? Um, right, or as he put it in the passage I just read, God that by right commandeth all things. By what right does God command all things? Well, um, so if someone has a right to command me, that means that knowing their will gives me a reason to do what they say, basically. Um, gives me a reliable, strong reason to do what they say. Um, uh, but technically, I guess that's the definition of, I don't have a right to disobey. Um, but I think if you look back in his def definition of command, you'll see that it, it doesn't really count as a demand unless there's a reason I have to obey you. Otherwise, it's just counsel, right? So um, God, ha you know, hath the right to command all things means whatever God's will is, I have a reason to follow it. But what is God's will? So remember, the human will is the last desire or aversion at the end of a deliberation. The deliberation is alternating desire and aversion as I take different consequences of a certain act into effect. The last one is my will. But as Hobbes says, uh, we can't attribute desire to God because desire is an attribute of finite beings. Right? I mean, desire means that I expect pain or pleasure from something or the means to pain or pleasure. Well, like an infinite omnipotent being doesn't expect pain or pleasure from anything. So strictly speaking, God doesn't have desire and therefore strictly speaking, God doesn't have will. And sure enough, uh, if you look in chapter 31, paragraph 26 on page 240, um, for just that reason, Bob says, and therefore, when we ascribe to God a will, it is not to be understood as that of man for a rational appetite. Now, actually, he criticized the definition of rational appetite back when he defined will um, as a scholastic definition that wasn't right. 
he's either you know wrote these two things at different times or he's in he's interpreting rational appetite as i think you could in such a way as to agree with his former definition right a rational appetite means an appetite that's the result of deliberation if you explain it that way then it agrees with his definition so uh, i'm going to go with that i think rational appetite here means uh will in the sense he defines it the last desire or aversion in a deliberation. But when we ascribe will to God a will, it is not to be understood as true as that of man for a rational appetite, but as the power by which he affecteth everything. So the conclusion, and we saw this before, uh, and I talked about this last week, um, that uh, God's right to command is nothing but God's absolute power to reward and punish. And then you have to remember what are divine punishments. Well, divine punishments are just the natural bad outcomes of violating the laws of nature. So, um, So the conclusion of all this is if you go back to that thing at the end of chapter 15 and you ask, what are we adding to the laws of nature when we regard them as divine commandments, therefore making them into laws, strictly speaking, and not just councils? Um, well, um, it really adds nothing to our original motives for following other than um, the idea of God as an incomprehensible explanation for why nature is the way it is, including why human nature is the way it is, right? I mean, all that stuff about God commanding and punishing and whatever, all boils down to, um, if I violate these laws, bad things will happen. And of course that's because of God, because everything is because of God's infinite power. Um, so therefore the conclusion is that the practical part of rational religion, leaving aside the worship issue for the moment, the practical part of, of natural religion is nothing but the dictates of natural reason as to what you should do. That is the laws of nature. Um, and if you like, you can say when you're thinking of it from a quote unquote religious point of view, that the laws of nature are laws because of God's command. But all that really means is that God has set up the world, including human nature in such a way. And by set up, we don't mean um, planned out for some purpose, because that would mean having desires and, and plans and deliberations and all that stuff that God doesn't have. By set up, we mean in some inc incomprehensible way through some incomprehensible infinite power caused to exist, right? So um, because God caused human nature to be the way it is, you should follow these laws because otherwise you'll get in trouble. Um, okay, so the other question, which is harder to answer then is why does reason suggest that we should honor God and in particular that we should honor God by worshiping God? So um, here's Hobbes' dis definition of worship. This is in uh, chapter 31, paragraph eight on page 238. Um, What's the light from this? Well, that's better. I'll bring this back. I like this again. Um, 
Okay. Um, so wait, where is this? This is, I said it was in paragraph eight on page two. Oh, yeah, okay, here it is. Um, courting, that is, a winning of favor by good offices, as by praises, by acknowledging their power, and by whatsoever is, is pleasing to them, from, to them from whom we look for any benefit. This is properly worship. Right, so worship means um, when you're talking about worshiping a human being, it means courting them, winning their favor by good offices, that is by praising them, acknowledging their power and whatever else is pleasing to them because you hope for a benefit from them. Now, I mean, we certainly understand according to the irrational religion that fears these invisible causes that are just like human beings, only stronger, um, why you would want to worship them. Because they're very, very powerful people from whom you expect some benefit. So you really want to figure out what will please them. And since they're like human beings, you can be sure at least that they'll be pleased by um, praises and acknowledgments of their power, and hopefully you can find out somehow whatever other things might please them. And therefore, thereby you can gain their favor and you can get benefits from them. But um, it's not really clear um, why a God of the kind Hobbes is saying we can rationally conclude to exist why it would make sense to worship such a God, right? I mean, again, it doesn't need anything from us. Nothing is gonna be pleasing to it um, because it's already infinitely pleased, so to speak, right? I mean, it doesn't, there isn't anything else it's looking for. So um, praising it, acknowledging its power um, is, not gonna do any good. Um, and moreover, since it doesn't have changing desires, deliberations, anything like that, nothing is gonna do any good, you know, for its own incomprehensible reason, or maybe you shouldn't even call it that. But anyway, um, it, uh, for reasons incomprehensible to us, causes good things to happen to some people and bad things to happen to other people as in the story of Job. And um, whether they do things that quote unquote please it or not is irrelevant. Of course, there are some things you can do that you can foresee will bring you benefits from God. But again, what that means is only that you come to understand what nature is like and you foresee the natural effects of what you do. And since nature is caused by God, you can call that finding out how to get benefits from God. But if you don't believe in God, you find out exactly how to get exactly the same benefits, right? Because it doesn't happen by examining the incomprehensible nature of God. That's a contradiction in terms. It happens by examining nature. So, um, so why would we worship, why would it be rational to worship God according to Hobbes? Um, so he does address this in chapter 31. So go back there to paragraph 13 on page 239. 
Um, the end of worship amongst men is power. For a man seeth another worshiped, he supposeth him, supposeth, <laughs> supposeth him powerful and is the readier to obey him, which makes his power greater. So this is why human beings want to be worshiped. I mean, of course they want to be worshiped because worshiping them do means doing things that are pleasing to them. So just on those grounds, they want to be worshiped. But I think as usual, Hobbes is pointing out that the immediate pleasure is less important than the power that, because we don't know how much power we might need to preserve our pleasure or prevent pain in the future. So the immediate pleasure we get is less important than the power it's going to give us of the future. Anyway, but going on to God, to God, but God has no ends, right? That's a summary of all the stuff I was just saying about God, according to Hobbes. And by the way, this is quite traditional, actually. I mean, this might sound surprising, but this is traditional. This is one of the most traditional things Hobbes says. Um, that God doesn't have desire or will or emotions in the sense that we do, right? So, but God has no ends. The worship we do him proceeds from our duty and is directed according to our capacity by those rules of honor that reason dictateth to be done by the weak to the more potent men in hope of benefit, for fear of damage, or in thankfulness for good already received from them. So this seems like a complete non sequitur as it's phrased, right? Because what it's saying is that reason suggests that we honor God in the way we would honor powerful human beings, even though reason tells us that God is not a powerful human being or like a powerful human being. So the reason we have for doing it in that case doesn't apply. Um, Do people understand why, are there questions about this? Do people understand why this is so puzzling? Okay, well, at least one person understood. Okay, <laughs> so, um, So there's two things that are relevant to this in paragraph 11, back on page 238. Again, still in chapter 31. Right, which is about arbitrary worship. That is things we do to honor someone, including to honor God that are not like naturally everywhere known to be signs of honor. Okay, but that, that's not so important. What's important is, um, but when free the worship consists in the opinion of the beholders, for if so, oh, sorry, for if to them the words or actions by which we intend honor seem ridiculous, intending to contumely, they are no worship because no signs of honor. No signs of honor because a sign is not a sign to him that giveth it, but to him to whom it is made, that is to the spectator. So this is what it says in the English version of, pack, of paragraph 11 of chapter 31. Um, now, um, If you look on the bottom of the next page, so I mean, so right, so first of all, what that says is that when you're trying to decide what actions are appropriate to worship God, you should ask yourself how the spectators are going to see it. Are they going to look on it as worship or not? So for some things that, you know, that naturally seem worshipful, um, you can assume the spectators will agree with you, but for other things, you know, it might depend on the customs of the country you're in or whatever. Um, um, so, uh, 
But if you, if you look in this footnote at the bottom of page 239, which gives the, as I mentioned, sometimes the footnotes in this edition give the Latin version when it's significantly different from the English version. So the Latin here says, but I see no end on account of which God omnipotent might wish himself to be worshiped, except that it might benefit us. So how is it gonna benefit us? So I think the implication is this. Um, if all the spectators, I think, I mean, he doesn't come out and say this, but I think the answer is this. If all the spectators were wise like Hobbes and like us, if we allow ourselves to be educated by Hobbes, if they all had science rather than just prudence, then the only worship of God would be obedience to the laws of nature. But it's because we, we can assume that the spectators don't have that, that it's to our benefit to act as if God is a powerful human being who enforces the laws of nature. And because enforcing the laws of nature also in a commonwealth will enforce the law of the commonwealth, right? Because the law of nature says that you should follow the, law, the civil law. So it's to the public benefits and therefore to our benefits, because remember the worst thing that could happen to anyone is for the commonwealth to dissolve back into the state of nature. So it's to our benefit to give signs that the beholder will take to mean that we think there's a very powerful person who can be pleased in the way that powerful human beings can be pleased, who's gonna enforce the laws of nature and the civil law. And that I think is why reason suggests that we do this. Okay, are there questions about that? Um, I mean, there's more than that going on in that in this chapter when he talks about worship, he's getting a hint in at the Puritans, like, you know, objecting to certain Anglican, like rituals that the Anglican church continued to keep up from Catholicism and saying that they're not biblical, so you shouldn't do them. And he's trying to explain how's the sovereign, how's the power to command the ways that God will be honored and so forth. But I think what I just said, I think is the main lesson that's not stated outright for, I guess, obvious reasons. Is that the reason to worship God, it, it, strictly speaking, that is give signs of honor to God is for the benefit of irrational spectators. Okay. Um, So, I mean, what all of that uh, sort of comes down to is, um, in terms of the political implications of Hobbes' doctrine about religion, um, you can look at it this way. On the one hand, the, the creation of a commonwealth and the fundamental laws of a commonwealth, if it's properly constructed, um, derive from the law of nature. So in that sense, every commonwealth is an institution of true rational religion, right? So it's rational religion in this sense. I guess maybe I should write this out. This would be, so in this sense, you know, religion is rational. And superstition is not. So, um, so a commonwealth, if it's con properly constituted, is constituted according to 
the law of nature. So if a commonwealth is constituted according to the law of nature, then it's an institution of the true religion of reason. Because again, the only practical content of the religion of reason um, is, uh, oh yeah, thank you Grant for filling that in. Um, the only uh, practical content of the religion of reason is that you should follow the law of nature. Um, And to the extent that the sovereign uh, fails to teach that that is at least part of the content of religion, that is that it's part of the content of religion that you should follow the laws of nature and therefore should follow the law of the commonwealth. If the sovereign fails to teach that, for example, if the sovereign teaches that um, there's divided power between the civil sovereign and the Pope or something like that, then to that extent, the sovereign is failing in their duty and the Commonwealth is not properly constituted. Whether you should say it's a, like not a Commonwealth at all or is a bad Commonwealth or whether it depends, which of those you say depends on how bad it is. I think Hobbes doesn't settle clearly anywhere. But, um, um, On the other hand, as long as the sovereign does teach that the laws of nature are part of the content of religion, then uh, whatever else the sovereign says, the commonwealth is still um, perfectly in line with the true religion. So, I mean, you might ask, why then is this all this stuff about the difference between Christianity and heathens and um, at least the corrupt later Jews who didn't understand that their revelation was really Christian? Um, Well, let me ask, first of all, what would be, and now, I mean, I'm finally going to come to talk a little bit about this, so there's not much time left. What, according to Hobbes, would be the difference between a commonwealth that was set up by a prophet who actually had instructions from God, whatever that means, right? Like, how can this incomprehensible thing give you instructions? This is not at all clear. He doesn't explain what that would come to but um, um, how would a commonwealth that's set up by a true prophet be different from a commonwealth that was set up by um, true philosophers? Not those vain prattling philosophers that the Greeks and Romans had, but true philosophers like Hobbes, right? So how would those commonwealths differ? And the answer is, um, Basically, they would not differ. <laughs> um, oops, what just happened to my cameras? Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. But you can't see me, of course. No. Because even I can't see me now. All right, I'm just gonna keep talking, I guess, and hope that uh, this will unfreeze because there's not much time left. Um, so, um, Oh, something just happened. Oh yeah, here we go.
I should maybe stop using this many cam thing. Although there's a lot of good features, but I just, I, mean, I feel like my machine's not powerful enough to run it. Well, anyway, um, so, uh, you know, I'm just gonna read this from the book, what he says, but this is a chapter 12, paragraph 12 on page 67. And he's talking about the seeds of religion, which, um, meaning the seeds of superstition. And remember, we saw before what the three seeds of religion were, that is being curious about causes, thinking everything has a cause, and um, uh, learning about causes from experience in such a way that you tend to invent causes for things where that if you don't see them. Um, so, uh, and what he says in paragraph 12 is, um, these seeds, quote, have received culture from two sorts of men. One sort have been they that have nourished and ordered them according to their own invention. The other have done it by God's commandment and direction. But both sorts have done it with a purpose to make those men that relied on them the more apt to obedience, laws, peace, charity, and civil society. Right, so you understand if God actually did give commands to someone to set up a commonwealth in some way, what could those commands contain? Well, the law of nature, basically. <laughs> so, um, uh, the other people who quote unquote didn't get them as commands from God are following exactly the same thing. They have exactly the same purpose. And similarly, he says in paragraph 20 there, the first founders and legislators of commonwealths among the Gentiles, whose ends were only to keep the people in obedience and peace, right? Meaning their end was to get people to follow the divine law, the law of nature have in all places taken care first to imprint in their minds a belief that those precepts which they gave concerning religion might not be thought to proceed from their own device, but from the dictates of some God or other spirit. Uh, I didn't write down what the second one was, but I guess I only wanted to quote the first one. So, right, meaning that if you're founding a commonwealth and you wanna get people to follow the laws of nature, but you know that most people are not philosophers or scientists, or they don't have reason. Um, what should you do? Uh, tell them that an invisible spirit told you that this is what they should do and will punish them if they don't. And give every evidence that you're worshiping that powerful spirit as if it were a very powerful person. And that's the best you can do because those people can't have what Hobbes is calling true religion. They can only have, or what Hobbes is calling religion in the sense of this third distinction, they can only have superstition. So every commonwealth, if it's properly constituted, is both going to um, uh, be an expression of true religion but also is gonna make use of superstition for the true quote unquote religious purpose that is for the purpose of maintaining civil peace. Okay, so there's only two minutes left here. So um, I'm just gonna say one more thing, which is, okay, suppose you find yourself, however, um, in a commonwealth where the sovereign has already established a religion. And that religion contains either A, absurd doctrines that you're supposed to believe, or B, dangerous doctrines that will actually tend to undermine the civil peace. What should you do? So in the first case, Hobbes says explicitly, and if you want to find this, it's in chapter 32, paragraph four, that what you should do is um, say the things that the sovereign tells you to say. 
but don't try to understand them. That's gonna lead you into false philosophy. They can't be understood. They can't be understood because um, they're unreasonable, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so they can't be understood because they shouldn't be understood. You know, so one thing he implies is that Aristotle perhaps went wrong, unless maybe Aristotle was just pretending, which he also entertains, that Aristotle perhaps went wrong because he tried to understand what was true in the Greek religion instead of just swallowing it whole. Hobbes literally uses that metaphor, right? He says some medicines are effective only if swallowed whole and not if <laughs> Um, So that's what you should do with the absurd doctrines. Just say them and don't think them. But what about the dangerous practical principles? And I think the answer to that is Hobbes doesn't tell us what to do, but he shows us what to do. And that's this whole complicated biblical exegesis about the authority of the church and the um, you know, mission of the apostles and so on and so forth results in the uh, really absurd conclusion that uh, Christianity was founded as a religion to get people to obey the civil state, right? When it was clearly was founded as a rebellion against the civil state, but, um, but by carefully interpreting things just the right way, <laughs> he makes it come out. Um, he, he is trying to like defang these dangerous doctrines. And I think that's what he's saying you should do. There's no authority to reform religion now. There shouldn't be. All you can do is offer interpretations that will make it safer. Okay, um, that's it for Hobbes. I know probably some people are gonna, breathing a sigh of relief. I like Hobbes. I like Locke more actually, but I like Hobbes. But anyway, uh, next time, Locke. <laughs> See you then, bye.